Welcome to the Performing Arts Series brought to you by the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network. I'm Maria Salvador, your moderator for today's program. I'm joined in the studio audience by creative writing students from Hilton High School. With us is award-winning comic book creator, teacher, and innovator, Jean Yang. His graphic novel, American Born Chinese, has won numerous awards, including the prestigious Prince Award for Excellence in Young Adult Literature and the Eisner Award for the Best Graphic New Album. It was also a National Book Award finalist. Welcome, Jean Yang. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, I wanted to remind you that today's program is interactive, and you'll have an opportunity to ask us questions later in the broadcast by calling the 800 number on the screen or by emailing us. We look forward to hearing from you. Jean, you started uh, creating comic books early on. What led you to this way of telling stories? Uh, well. I grew up listening to stories from my parents. My parents are immigrants. Uh, my dad was born in Taiwan and my mom in mainland China. Uh, and one of the primary ways that we interacted with each other was them telling me stories. So very early on, I was interested in stories. Very early on, I was also very interested in drawing. My mom tells me that I started drawing when I was two years old. So the two forms of drawn storytelling that, uh, that I think are most popular are animation and comics. And between the two, I think comics establishes uh, an intimacy between the creator and the reader that's very unique that I, I really wanted to take advantage of. How so? Um, well, I think when you compare animation and comics, animation is so labor intensive that it's very rare that you'll have an animation created by a single individual. Comics is also labor intensive, but it's not to the point where you need a whole team of people to do it. You can have one person be in charge of the writing and the drawing and the inking and the lettering. Because of that, um, reading a comic that's well done is sort of like reading a page out of somebody's diary. So you think it relates to the, to the reader in a different way? Yeah, yeah. Just, just like how you can tell something about somebody by looking at their handwriting, you can tell something about somebody by looking at their drawing style. Okay. How long before you went to college did, did, you, did you really explore uh, this medium, uh, which combined two techniques of storytelling, the visual and the textual? Well, I, I grew up wanting to be an animator. Okay. Uh, in in uh, elementary school, I was kind of obsessed with Walt Disney. I had to do this biography report in, in third grade, and I chose Walt Disney, and from then on, I was obsessed. Uh, there, was this, there was this book called uh, The Art of Walt Disney that I checked out over and over and over again from the library. Uh, at one point, I even had a giant picture of Walt Disney hanging in my, in my bedroom. It was a headshot. It didn't have any of his drawings or anything. It was just a headshot of Walt Disney. And when my friends would come over, they thought it was really creepy. They would say, why do you have that creepy old man hanging in your bedroom? And I'd say, that's not any old creepy old man. That's Walt Disney. Uh, it changed for me in fifth grade. I bought my very first comic book. Um, my mom took me to the local bookstore. And back then, they had these wireframe spinner racks that held individual issues of comics. So uh, I, I saw this issue of a comic I liked. Um, it was a Marvel two-in-one starring these two monsters. One was the Thing from Fantastic Four, and the other one was Rom the Space Knight, who wasn't around anymore, unfortunately. I asked my mom to buy that for me, and she said no, because she thought the two characters were too scary. So she bought me the um, latest issue of Superman. Now, it was 1984 at the time, and in the issue of Superman that she bought me, the atomic bomb drops in 1986. And the whole world is thrown into chaos. Superman teams up with these guys called the Atomic Knights who rode around the countryside on these giant mutated Dalmatians, and they all fight crime <laughs> together. But uh, that, that book freaked me out. I stayed up late nights thinking about the atomic bomb and thinking about giant mutated dogs and about Superman. And, um, and it really got under my skin in a way uh, where I started thinking about comics more and more. I, I, I realized through that book, through, it, it's, you know, it's silly and it's a little trashy, but it, it, I realized through that book that if you take still images and text and you combine them together, you can achieve effects that neither one of those media can achieve on their own. Interesting. So in, in high school and college, I started thinking, when I got out of school, did I want to be an animator or did I want to be a cartoonist? And a class that I took in college during the summer really cemented my decision for me. It was an animation class. I realized how labor-intensive animation is and, and how difficult it is for one person to tell a story all by himself in that, in that medium. 
you know, I, I think the, the class was maybe six weeks long, and I got 30 seconds out of that, that whole six weeks. Interesting. Well, as you mentioned, uh, you started creating comics at an early age, but your evolution as a graphic novelist didn't really start until later. Let's take a look at this next piece that explores the many stages of your life as a cartoonist. Meet Gene Yang. He's a computer science teacher by day and a graphic novelist by night. And this is his life. Gene's graphic novel, American Born Chinese, has made him a standout, building an unexpected fan base of both comic book readers and educators. Gene's passion for cartoons and telling stories led him to become a published author. After graduating, I realized that since I had been a comic book fan all of my life, one of my life's goals was to publish one issue of a comic book. I decided I can't die peacefully without doing that. And I discovered that you need about $3,000 to publish a comic. So I decided that I would work as hard as I could over a summer and save that $3,000. And I did. At around the same time, I also heard about this grant called the Xeric Grant. Gene applied for the Xeric Grant for self-publishing comic books, and much to his surprise, he got funding to produce his first issue. Well, something about that entire experience really got under my skin. I realized that this was something I wanted to do again and again and again. So I ended up using the $3,000 I'd saved to publish the second issue, and then I saved another $3,000 to, to publish the third issue. Although Gene was now a self-published author, he was looking for other avenues to distribute his work. Mini comics are basically comics that you draw at your drawing table and then you take to your local Kinko's or your local photocopy store and you run them off. And then you hand staple them and you bring them to different um, comic book stores or different comic book conventions and sell them by hand. So I did this for a number of years. I published mini comics for a number of years. And I also was able to foster a lot of really strong friendships with other people who were into comics and especially into mini comics. It was through this experience that he met friend and future collaborator Derek Kirk Kim, which would eventually lead to Gene's big break. During the time when I was publishing mini comics, I also ended up doing a collaborative project with a friend of mine named Derek Kirk Kim. That was the very first time I ever worked with another publisher. It was, um, it was a thrill to be published by Image, especially because I grew up reading Image comics. Soon after Derek and Gene's collaboration, Duncan's Kingdom, Gene began working with other publishers. He worked with a Catholic publisher on an adaptation of the Roman Catholic prayer entitled The Rosary Comic Book. At around that time, uh, I was picked up by another comic book publisher named Slave Labor Graphics, and they ended up collecting the very first series that I had done as self-published comics, Gordon Yamamoto and the King of the Geeks, together into a graphic novel. And then they also collected the second series I'd done which is called Loyola Shin and the San Pelican Order. They collected that into a graphic novel as well. Derek put out a comic of his own that won the three major comic book industry awards. After that, all these publishers, these big New York book publishers, started calling him up, asking him what his next project was. Well, he's a really good friend. So he actually invited me over to his house one day. He asked me to bring printouts of American Born Chinese, which I had been working on for about three years at the time. He asked me to bring printouts to his house, and he took these printouts, he um, bound them he t with his own money, and then sent it off uh, to one of the publishers who was courting him with his own money as well. And then he pestered that publisher over and over and over again until he read my comic. And that's how I ended up getting picked up by First Second. With the publishing of American Born Chinese, Gene's novel was soon on bookshelves across the country. It's a little bit disconcerting to, to have received all these rewards because American Born Chinese came out, it came out like this, you know, it came out like this. It came out Xerox and I would sell maybe 12 copies at a convention and that'd be a good day, you know. So, so to get all this attention from these different corners is, is really, um, really mind-boggling. American-born Chinese earned Gene critical acclaim and even the coveted comic book industry award, the Eisner. That, you know, that, that's, the, that's the one award that when, when you're a young comic book artist, like in a teen, when you're a teenager, you dream about 
that award. So, so getting that was, uh, it was really like a dream come true. Today, Gene is giving back to his fans, comic book readers and educators alike, by speaking to these groups through book tours and conventions and sharing his passion for comics and their potential to engage and educate. But the biggest impact of Gene's success has been in his own relationships. Although Gene has reached his goal of becoming a published author, he continues to work as a cartoonist while still pursuing his other love, teaching. With the immediate success of American-born Chinese, how has this changed your relationship with your family? Well, my, my dad is a very practical man. You know, he, he uh, immigrated here from Taiwan. He worked really, really hard to put himself through graduate school. He worked as an engineer to support us. So when I went to college, he told me, you have to major in something practical. And if you major in something practical, I'll leave you alone after that. So I did. I majored in computer science, and I minored in creative writing. And then after I graduated, I worked for a couple of years as a programmer. Um, my dad was pretty happy with that. Then at, a, at the about at the same time I started drawing comics, I also started teaching. So I, I left my programming job um, to pursue these two things. Uh, my dad wasn't so happy after that. <laughs> so about every month or two, uh, for a good chunk of time, I would get these little envelopes from him in the mail. And inside the envelopes would be these newspaper clippings that talked about how much programmers were making, uh, which companies in the Silicon Valley were looking for programmers, different salary scales, and of course teaching was always at the very end. And cartoonist wasn't even on the scale. Uh, and, uh, and that just happened for several years. He would just send me these little newspaper clippings. After the success of American Born Chinese, those newspaper clippings stopped. And uh, recently, at, at my last birthday, he gave me this card where he talked about how I had made all these choices that he wouldn't necessarily have made if he were in my position. But he's really happy that they all worked out for me, and he's really proud of me. So it's really, it's really flipped things with, with my relationship with my Interesting. dad. Interesting. Well, you, you, you draw from, you seem to draw yourself in American Born Chinese, and certainly the influence of your family is apparent in, in the book. Talk about that a little bit. You know, how, how do you, how, why did you choose to, to draw yourself in this book? Um, well, when I started American Born Chinese, I had done graphic novels for a number of years, and I'd always had Asian American characters, but I never dealt with the issue of Asian American identity head on. And I really wanted to do that because it's such a big part of who I am and such a big part of how I define myself. I remember when I was young um, being kind of ashamed of my culture and along with that shame of culture there's a shame of family as well. Okay. So American Born Chinese is sort of my way of thinking about those issues and working those issues out on paper. Well, you use a stereotype of a Chinese man, an American Born Chinese, and it makes some readers very uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And that was intentional? That was intentional, yeah. I, uh, Cousin Chinky, that's the character that you're referring to. Who, he's the amalgamation of all the negative Asian and Chinese stereotypes that I could think of. And he's probably the most controversial part of my book. When my publisher uh, first put uh, the book out for um, preview, they sent out a whole bunch of copies to different bookstores, independent bookstores around the nation. And there were a couple of Asian American bookstores that refused to carry it after flipping through the book and seeing that character. Uh, later on, they changed their minds after, after they actually read the book. Um, but the reason why I chose to include him was I think that cartooning is a very powerful way of talking about stereotypes. You know, when you describe a stereotype in prose, that doesn't hit you in the gut the same way that a drawing of that stereotype hits you. And I think we see examples of that all over, right? With the, with the Danish uh, uh, Islamic cartoons, we, mm -hmm. see, we see how, how powerful comics can be in how powerful people's reactions to cartoons can be. So I thought that exploring stereotypes in a, in a very direct way in comics would be a very good way, a very powerful way of, of talking about it. Now, uh, I tend to get two reactions to the Cousin Chinky character. One is people feel very uncomfortable with it. And that makes me happy, because that's kind of what I was going for. I wanted people to, to feel uncomfortable, you know? And, and if people are laughing at the Cousin Chinky character, I want them to do that with a, with a knot in their stomach. With, with, a, with a feeling of unease. There are, there's a minority reaction to Cousin Chinky where people will come up to me at conventions and go, oh, that character is so, so cute, and he, he's so funny and adorable. 
And that kind of reaction makes me uncomfortable. It puts a knot in my stomach. Yeah, you know? I bet. <laughs> so so one of my one of my regrets with the book is not making Cousin Chinky even more monstrous than he is. Like I made his head round and I think maybe I should have chosen a different a different shape and I should have I should have exaggerated him a little bit more. I don't know how you could have, frankly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad you feel that way. Well, Monkey is is clearly a major player in American born Chinese. Mm -hmm. But Monkey also appears in, in a short story that's in a recent collection, or a forthcoming collection, called Up All Night. Um, tell us about how Monkey plays a role in both American-born Chinese and in what was first a mini-comic, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Monkey King isn't my character. He's, he's a very, very popular Chinese legendary character. And in China, he actually occupies two spaces. He's in the literary space because the novel that he originally appeared in is considered one of the pillars of Chinese literature. And he's also in this popular space. So there are, uh, you know, lunch boxes and Saturday morning cartoons and comics all about the Monkey King. Um, when I decided I wanted to do my own adaptation of the Monkey King, uh, I looked around and I saw that in Asia, he's so popular, he's almost a genre in and of himself. So almost every comic book artist uh, worth his own salt has done something with the monkey. You know, something, some kind of adaptation. Even Osamu Tezuka, who's considered the god of manga in Japan, has done an adaptation of the Monkey King story. So I couldn't think of how I could add my own spin to it. Eventually, I came across this idea of retelling the story from an Asian-American perspective. So that's what I've tried to do with um, the piece in American Born Chinese. Now the piece in Up All Night, um, that was originally published as a mini-comic and it was kind of a warm-up project to American Born Chinese. I knew that American Born Chinese would take me a long time to do uh, and I wanted to try out the character and I also wanted to try out a few drawing techniques as I was, you know, before working on this, this giant project. So the motherless one, the, the story that's in Up All Night, was, was my way of doing that. It was just a warm-up. That's fascinating. Comic books or graphic novels, as they're now known, are increasing in popularity. Why do you think they're the hottest ticket in publishing today? There are lots of theories about this. People in the book industry and in the comic book industry debate this left and right. Uh, my own personal take, I think there's a whole bunch of things that have happened. Uh, one is there's a popularity in... In, in this country right now um, of Japanese culture. You know, we see Japanese cartoons on the Cartoon Network and um, Japanese food is also very popular. So, so manga, which is, which is Japanese comics, is such an important part of Japanese culture that that got imported as well. Uh, when I first started teaching 10 years ago, I would try to be the cool teacher by telling my students that I drew comics on the side and, and my students would just look at me kind of blankly and go, you know, the last time I read a comic was in third grade. Why are you telling me this? But about five years ago, I saw this shift. You know, I started, I started seeing my students in the back of my class reading comics. And as a teacher, I had to go take it away and give them attention. But as a cartoonist, secretly, I was kind of glad that they were actually reading comics. You know, so we've seen this, this shift where students went from not reading any comics at all to now uh, the comics in our school library are among some of the most popular items in that library. So I think manga had a very important role in the popularization of graphic novels in general. Interesting. So it was an import importation of, of a culture as well as yeah, one yeah, aspect of that so. culture. I believe so. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. I know this is a totally uninformed question, but what is the difference between manga and anime? Well, manga is the Japanese word for comic books, and anime is the Japanese word for animation. So a lot of okay. times you'll have manga and anime with the same characters but they're in two different media. Oh, okay. What impact has the internet had on this medium? I think that's, a, that's another reason why we're seeing uh, a current growth in the popularity of, of graphic novels. Um, the web has really gotten people used to this idea of multimedia. So most web pages nowadays uh, combine all sorts of different distinct media into a single unified reading experience. So on a web page you'll have text and you'll have a uh, still image or two, and sometimes you'll even have a sound bite or, uh, or a video clip. And people see that as one web page. They experience that as one web page. Comics is also a multimedia medium. It takes two distinct media, it takes still images and text, and combines them into a unified experience. So in a way, I think that um, people's familiarity with websites and with the World Wide Web in general 
has prepared them to become graphic novel readers. Interesting. It takes me a lot longer to read a graphic novel than a standard print novel. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of others um, who, who have a similar experience. Why is that so different? Is it because we're trying to decode uh, a system of, of codes that, that are not necessarily as familiar to us, the, the visuals? What is it? I, I think that um, comics operates on two different levels. There's the text and there's the image. And it's definitely an acquired skill. Reading comics is definitely an acquired skill because your mind has to take these two things and unify them. You know, uh, Part of a uh, comic book creator's job is to direct the flow of the reader's eye and the flow of the reader's mind as he or she goes through the comic book page. And you have to direct it in a way that, um, that will help the reader unify those two things, unify the, the images and the text. Now that plays into the creative process. That's a big part of um, the creation of comics is thinking about eye flow and thinking about the structure of your page and structuring it so that it goes, um, so that the reader's eyes and mind go the way you want them to. Another part, another reason why I love comics so much is that um, the creation process is so personal. Every cartoonist has his or her own way of going about things. There's no really one right way of creating a comic. Um, my own creative process was something that I arrived at after years and years and years, and it's still changing. I'm still thinking about new ways of streamlining certain things, new ways of um, putting error checking in my process. We have a video clip that actually shows the details of my creative process. Okay, shall we see it? So let's take a look at it. Okay. A comic book page is made up of, of panels and gutters. Panels are the squares that contain the pictures. And every panel usually expresses a moment in the story or a single unified action within the story. The gutters are the spaces that separate the panels. And in many ways, the magic of comics happens between the gutters. That's where the story really takes place, is when um, the reader's mind fills in the time between one panel and the other. In addition to, to panels and gutters, there are also word balloons. Uh, those are the big circles that contain all the words that uh, the characters speak. And there are also sound effects, which are words that sit outside of word balloons and represent sounds that are occurring in the story. Every project starts with an idea. And for me, those ideas uh, can come from just about anywhere. Sometimes it'll be something that a friend says that catches my attention, or it'll be something that I see on the street. Uh, one of my projects, my very first comic that I ever did as an adult, Gordon Yamamoto and the King of the Geeks, uh, that story is about a young man who gets a spaceship stuck in his nose. And then he becomes friends with the alien that's driving that ship and he learns all these deep life lessons from the alien. The way I got that, uh, that idea is I have always had a lot of nasal problems. So my nose is always stuffed up, you know, one side or the other is always stuffed up. So one day I just thought, what if the reason why it's stuffed up is because something's sentient inside? And that's how I got that idea. With American Born Chinese, I had to get a lot of pictures of schools and of libraries and of, um, of parks in order to draw a lot of the backgrounds. I'm not very good at imagining environments, so a lot of times with the environments, I'll need reference photos. At the very end of American Born Chinese, the very last scene takes place in a cafe that serves boba milk tea. And I went there with a friend one afternoon and we took some pictures of the cafe, of the outside and of the tables inside. And I used those reference photos for that very last scene. I, I usually mull over a story for, for a good deal of time. Sometimes it'll be a week or two, or sometimes it'll be a month or two, and sometimes it'll be a year. At some point, I'll feel like I have a beginning, middle, and end. And then I'll write up a, an outline of it using just a regular word processor. The outline usually ends up being anywhere between a page or two, and it'll devote a paragraph to every major event, or about every chapter, to describe exactly what happens. After that, um, I move on to scripting. Now for a comic book, 
The script looks a lot like a movie script, but it's not quite as formalized. Uh, for me, uh, I usually describe what each panel looks like and give snippets of what the dialogue is. When the script uh, feels solid to me, I move on to thumbnailing. Thumbnailing is basically a uh, thumbnailing is basically where you do a sketch for each of your pages to get a general sense of what the page outline, the page layout looks like. You'll get a sense of where your panels are, where the gutters fall, that sort of thing. What shots you're going to be using within your panels. I'll start my thumbnails with really, really loose sketches in my sketchbook and once these are done I'll move on to more tight thumbnails on this little template that I made for myself in Photoshop. So after I finish thumbnailing and before I start drawing the final pages I'll go through a series of character designs. This is where I'll draw a character over and over and over again until I get that character to the point where it feels like he or she flows out of my pen. I do all of my drawing on vellum. Um, I start with pencils and I'll pencil on one side of the vellum and then I'll ink on the other side. Vellum is a see-through paper so you can see your pencils uh, even when you're inking on the reverse side. The reason why I do that is that I find looking at your mirror image, the mirror image of your drawing, gives you an easy way of uh, seeing the mistakes that you made when you were drawing it. Once the inks are done, I put them into my scanner, I scan them into the computer and then I do my lettering on the computer. I also do touch up on the computer. I actually don't use any whiteout when I'm drawing. So when I make a mistake, I wait until I get it scanned into the computer to fix that mistake. I'm surprised that you don't use the computer much beyond simply scanning. What's your take on computer-generated art? Um, I think that computers are becoming a bigger and bigger part of how cartoonists create their art. I know there are, there are some cartoonists that I really admire that only use computers. So for instance, Scott McCloud, he recently did a book called Making Comics, which is a comic about making comics. And he didn't use a, a pen or, or a single sheet of paper to create that book. That was all done on computer. There's another guy named Kyle Baker who draws exclusively on computer now. And his, his art has this, has this life to it that um, is difficult to achieve outside of electronic media. For me personally, I'm really used to drawing on paper, you know, and I, I can't afford one of those Wacom tablets that you can draw directly on. Uh, so when those prices come down, I might actually move to exclusive computers. But until then, I'm still going to be drawing on paper. Well, how does the combination of text and illustration in a comic book differ from other illustrated books, even, say, the picture book? Well, I think with <coughs> comics, um, the, the weight of the narration the, the, the responsibility of the narration um, can shift more easily between the picture and the pictures and the, and the words. With a, with a traditional um, children's book, the, the responsibility of the narration usually sits with the text and the pictures are more incidental. Now that's changing too. I see nowadays there are a lot of, com or a lot of uh, children's books that are actually comic books in a different format. Absolutely. You know, they, they draw from the language of comics. But generally speaking, comics will allow that, that shifting of responsibility between the visuals and the text. I actually kind of see comic books and, and uh, picture books on a kind of continuum. Yeah. The more basic uh, comic book techniques are on the picture book side, and then it gets more complex. Yeah, as you... there, there is yeah. definitely a continuum. There's, there are a lot of uh, children's books that are really just comic books, like, like Good Night Gorilla is an example. That was, that's one of my son's favorite books, and that's basically <laughs> a comic book. Okay. Well... How can this format, the graphic format, comic book format, be used to inform or even instruct, maybe shed light on, on abstract ideas? You've done that to some extent, haven't I, you? I've used um, comics as a teacher in a couple of ways. Um, one is I used to teach this computer art class 
uh, at my school. And one of the units that we did was on comics. So we did a unit on still art, then we did a unit on comics, then we did a unit on animation and on film. So um, during the comics unit, um, I found that comics is a very good way of incorporating writing into a, an art class. Uh, at that point, our school was pushing this idea of writing across the curriculum. And uh, comics was just a very natural way of, of getting writing into, into that class. Uh, a second way I used it was in uh, an Algebra 2 class that I had to sub. So um, an Algebra 2 teacher at my school had to go on long-term leave. I was called in as a sub. And um, unfortunately, I had to be out of that classroom that I was subbing about once every two or three weeks. Uh, so during that time, I had to come up with some way of conveying the information to, to the students. I tried two different ways. The first way was I tried to videotape myself giving lectures, and I would ask my sub to play those videotapes to the class. The students hated it. They, they came up to me and they told me, you know, you're boring in person, but in, in video you're unbearable. <laughs> so I tried a different technique. I tried to actually draw out the, the, the lessons as, as uh, comics. So I did it really quick. I did it with a Sharpie with no pencils beforehand. And usually the lessons came out between uh, four and six pages long. And I would have my sub Xerox them and hand them out to the class. This worked way better than the video. Uh, when I talked to the students to figure out why they preferred comics to, to video, they said that comics, with the comics, um, first it was visual like the video mm -hmm. is, uh, and second is that it's what I call permanent. So with a comic, the reader determines how fast the information is being conveyed. Whereas with a video, the, the lecturer is determining the, the speed of information, uh, information uh, dispersal. Uh, so in a comic, because on a comic your past, present, and future all sit on the same page, if a reader doesn't understand something, they can go back and read it. So it combines this, this visualness that they liked with the ability to control the flow of information. The pacing. Yeah. It's fascinating. Well, before we continue, I'd like to invite the view viewing audience to, to begin uh, sending in their questions uh, by using the email address on the screen or by calling the 800 number. We'd love to hear from you. As you've, as you've indicated, you're also a full-time employee in, in a school in the, in the Bay Area. How does that, if it does, influence your work? Um, well, I, in the beginning, I, you know, at the very beginning when I first started teaching, I tried to tell students that I was, uh, I was a comic book artist. And very quickly I realized that wasn't a good way of being the cool teacher because comics at that point just weren't that cool. So, so after that, I tried to keep them separate. You know, okay. I would try to have a life as a cartoonist at night and a life as a, uh, a high school teacher by day. Uh, after all the craziness with American Born Chinese, they kind of came back together again. But I do think that um, these two passions, comics and education, have a lot of overlap. So for instance, I did my master's in education with um, Cal State Hayward, and my final project was on using comics in education. So what came out of that was a, an electronic version of those lessons that I, I gave to that Algebra 2 class. Right. So I have, I have an electronic comic strip online um, that goes through factoring, which is one of the toughest topics in Algebra 2. It's excellent. Um, how do you achieve a balance, though? You're a teacher by day and a dad as well as a comic book artist uh, by night. How do, you, how do you strike a balance? That's, that's something that I, I still struggle with. <laughs> I don't know if I've really achieved a balance. Starting next year, I am going to be going part-time at my school so I can have um, a little bit of more of a balance between the two different jobs. But they're both things that I love, and I hope that I'll always be involved in, in cartooning and I'll always be involved in education. What, what can we look for next uh, from Jean Yang? I mean, what are you working on now? Well, I have a couple of projects that I'm working on. Uh, one is a collaboration with Derek Kirk Kim. Uh, we're doing a collection of short stories. The very first story in that collection is actually Duncan's Kingdom, which we did for Image Comics Neat. several years ago. And uh, the, uh, the theme of the short story collection is a connection between fantasy and reality. Now, is, it, is, this, is, is this completely the comic format? Yeah, it's all, it's all short okay. stories done in comic format. Neat. And that'll be out from uh, First Second, who's the publisher of American okay. Born Chinese, at the beginning of 2009. Will it be in color or black and It'll white? It'll be in color. It'll okay. be in color. Yeah, they're, they're, Duncan's Kingdom was originally published in black and white, but Derek's going through and coloring the whole thing. Interesting. So, now, um, American Born Chinese is in color. Yeah. 
and and yet the, the mini comics were all black and white. Yeah. What do you think of the use of color? Do you do you like it? Do you not like it? Why? Well, color color is really expensive, just from a very pragmatic standpoint. Mm. It's very very expensive. So for for a mini comics creator to do color, it's just it's very difficult. You know, unless you're doing something very short, um, you can't really afford color. Uh, when I was approached by First Second, they were putting together a line of comics that they saw as the intersection of American comics, Japanese comics, and European comics. So the format that they chose was kind of a combination of all of those. The, the size of the book follows with manga tradition, and then the color inside actually follows with a European tradition. Europeans have a really strong tradition of, of color comics. You're suggesting that color is, is cultural, the use of color in, in art and in, in offshoots of, of more traditional art. Talk about that. Why is, why is, what is the difference between Asian and European? Well, um, Asian, there's, there's strong comics traditions in both of those continents. Um, in Europe, it's centered around France and around uh, French-speaking Belgium, and then in, in Asia, it's centered around Japan. So those two cultures love comics, but they have very different conventions. In Europe, most comics are published in album format, so mm -hmm. they're really big. You know, they, they kind of look like almost Tintin. coffee table books. Yeah, like Tintin. Tintin's the most popular version. And then in, in Japan, they're published in manga format, which is much smaller. It looks like a, a paperback novel, and they're usually in black and white. European comics are in color. I think my personal theory about why that difference exists is that I think that in Europe, um, those comics came out of the European still art tradition. There's a very strong tradition of still art in, in Europe. You know, a, lots of great painters came out of that, uh, that culture. And in manga, I think, manga was more influenced by Asian storytelling traditions. So uh, around World War II and before, there are these vagrant storytellers that would travel from village to village in Japan, and they would bring with them these really simple brush paintings. They would sit in the middle of a village and they would tell stories to the children of the village and afterwards they would ask for, uh, for some money. And uh, those, those, uh, those simple line drawings were really just an aid to the story. So in manga, it seems to me that the emphasis has always been on the story, whereas in, in European comics, it seems like the emphasis is more on the visuals. Interesting. We have a caller from Chesapeake, Virginia. Go ahead, David. How did you become such a fascinating artist? How did I become friends with other artists? Is that what? Yeah, and how did you start to write and do all the pretty pictures and stuff? <laughs> Well, uh, I, I became friends with uh, Derek Kirk Kim, who's another cartoonist, and a, and a whole crew of other cartoonists through comic book conventions. So uh, Derek and I, uh, the very first time I tabled at a, at a convention was the very first time that Derek tabled at a convention, and we met at an after party. We traded comics, and then we um, really liked each other's stuff, so we started calling and hanging out. Now, I need to ask you, you, you tabled at a conference? Tell us about that. Well, tabling, tabling at a comic book convention isn't that impressive. All it means is you call up the convention organizers a couple months before the convention and you say, you know, I have a comic to sell. Can I get a table space? Okay. And then you pay 40 or 100 bucks and you get this table and you okay. can sell your comics from that table. All right. We have uh, some questioners in our audience. Um, do we have a question now? Yes. Um, how do you decide if your books are in color or black and white? That's mostly been an economic decision. So um, I'd always planned on publishing American Born Chinese in color because I'd started off Xeroxing them. I figured eventually when I collected them into a graphic novel, it would be black and white because that was the cheapest way to go. But uh, First Second is a very strong proponent of color, my publisher. So they really encouraged me to go find a colorist to work with, and I did. And do you do your own coloring? I don't do my own coloring. All the color books that I've done, have been colored by Lark Pien, who's uh, a fellow Bay Area cartoonist. She does her own comics, and she was nice enough to color mine. Interesting. I didn't yeah. realize. So it takes you're you're sort of heading towards the animation. Yeah, yeah. That's you know I would color my own comics if I could, but I have a horrible color sense. Like my <laughs> sometimes when I when I'm about to leave for work in the morning, my my wife will say, "Did you look at what you're wearing? Well, how can you wear that to work?" Because I just have a horrible color sense. We have another phone call. Caller, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering what kind of techniques you use to keep the reader reading and not want to stop. Mm. Um, 
One of my favorite things about the comic book medium is the page flip, where you hide something behind a page. So um, the last panel before a page flip is, uh, is a setup panel. You, know, you, you try to put a question in the reader's mind that they want an answer for, and you provide the answer on the other side of the flip. So that's one of my favorite techniques. Interesting. Interesting. So, so as in a, a, a more traditional format, the page turn is, is really critical. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's one of my favorites, at least. All right. We have uh, an email call, um, an email question, um, who's asking, uh, what inspired the character of Wei Chen? Uh, was he based on anyone in particular that you knew growing up? Well, um, Wei Chen, uh, the inspiration for Wei Chen came from a couple of sources. One was, when I was in third or fourth grade, there was a kid that immigrated into my neighborhood from Taiwan. And um, he was a year younger than me, and he didn't really speak a lot of English. He spoke Mandarin Chinese, which is my first language. The teachers found out that I spoke Mandarin Chinese, and they really encouraged me to become friends with this kid. Uh, and I really, really didn't want to. I didn't want to from the depths of who I was. And I couldn't figure out why. I didn't know why when I was that young. But this kid just followed me around for like a week. You know, everywhere I went, he would be, he would be right behind me. And eventually, a friend and I, had to throw tan bark at him to get him to leave me alone. And I was happy at the time that he left me alone. But looking back on that incident as an adult, I realized that, you know, well, first I feel really ashamed that I did that to this poor kid. And second, I realized that a lot of the reason why I didn't want to hang out with him was because of a shame uh, that I had inside of myself about my own culture and about who I was. So that, was, that, that kid was, was one of the inspirations of Wei Chen. A second one was when I was in junior high, um, my neighborhood became significantly more Asian and Asian American. And there were these two groups of Asian boys in my grade. Uh, one group, uh, we were all uh, born in America or, or came here when we were really young. We spoke, you know, English was the language that we were most comfortable with. Uh, there was another group of kids that we called the FOBs, the Fresh Off the Boats. And they were kids that had immigrated much later. They, they, they came when they were in 6th, 7th, 8th grade. Uh, we had this strange relationship with that other group. Like, we, we were kind of friends with them, but we really didn't want to be associated with them too much, you know? Uh, and um, that tension between these two groups of boys was what I wanted to capture in the friendship between Jin, my character Jin, and my character Wei Chen. Fascinating. We have a call from Massachusetts. Uh, Nick, go ahead. Hi. I'm enjoying your program. Uh, I have a question. How do you... Uh, as an educator, how do you see this, um, of using this for students that may be troubled or uh, to, as a, uh, an outlet for expression or uh, to help them? I, I often see here in, in Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, children that uh, are, are very creative, and when you give them the opportunity to find an outlet for that creativity, it seems like it changes their, uh, um, the way they handle school. <coughs> do you, have you worked with any children in that fashion? I've, I've heard from a lot of educators who use comics uh, in remedial reading classes. They found that comics is a really, it's a, it's a really effective gateway drug to, to more reading. Um, and, uh, and I've heard from uh, teachers who use comics in, uh, second, uh, in English as a second language environments, and they've used it very effectively in those, in those environments. I personally think that comics isn't just for remedial readers. It's, it's for everybody because in, in modern society, we communicate in a multimedia way. You know, it's just as easy to email a picture as it is to email a piece of text. So people really need to understand the nature of different media, and I think comics is a very good way of doing that. When you teach a student to create a comic book, what you're actually teaching them is to make decisions about media. You know, uh, when you're creating a comic book, for every piece of information that you're trying to convey, you have to decide whether you want to convey that as a still image or as a piece of text. So the way you make that decision is by having an intimate knowledge of both of those media. And one can certainly enhance the other. Yes, of course. You know, one can certainly enhance the other. It's interesting. We have a question in our audience. Uh, go ahead. Yes, um, I was wondering what artists have influenced your work. I have a I have a lot of favorite artists, favorite cartoonists. Um, I like I really like Linda Berry, who did a book called One Hundred Demons. Mm -hmm. um, I like um, Art Spiegelman, who did Mouse, who's the it's the only graphic novel to have ever won a Pulitzer yes. Prize. And uh, there's another guy named Jay Stevens, who's uh, a popular cartoonist 
who I really like, and, and Jeff Smith and Osamu Tezuka, yes. the, uh, the god of manga. Uh, on the more literary side, I've recently been reading a lot of books by Shusaku Endo, who is a Japanese Catholic author. His most famous book is called Silence, and he has a very, very poetic, almost visual way of describing scenes. I've actually read that. It's yeah, an it's a great book. it's a great book. Yeah. We have an email question. Um, where did you get the idea of telling three separate stories in American Born Chinese and then having the stories intertwine? Well, um, when I started American Born Chinese, I was coming up with different ways of addressing uh, ethnic identity, and I came up with these three different ideas, and I couldn't decide which one I liked the best. So in the end, I decided to try to do a project that included all three. And, and, and um, getting them to connect at the very end was almost like a puzzle. It was almost like a, an intellectual exercise. Interesting, because the reader doesn't get it at first either, necessarily, you know? And it yeah. takes a... F it took me a while. <laughs> yeah, I was trying, to, I was trying to, to put a little shock value by having them all combine yeah, at the it end. Was, it was very well done. Well, thank you. Thank you. We have an, another phone call from Kansas. Uh, Jack, are you there? Yeah. Okay. My question is, would you ever take comic book writing for your main career? Um, I think that uh, I might go crazy if I do. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm worried about. Comics can be really lonely. You know, you spend most of your time in front of either your computer or your drawing table. And, you, and if you're a full-time comic book writer, you can sometimes go for weeks without talking with somebody else. I think that having... Uh, a more extroverted job in education and a more introverted job in comics actually provides me with a balance that I like. So I'd like the percentages to, to shift a little. I'd like to be able to spend more time in comics uh, and hopefully that'll happen next year. But I don't think I necessarily ever want to work on comics full time, like with all of my time. Your children would keep you. That's true too. Rooted yeah. too though. I mean, you know, there's <laughs> no question about that. We have another audience question. Um, what advice would you give to a high school student who wants to become a graphic novelist? Um, well, find a day job that you like, I think is, is uh, I think, I actually, I honestly believe that. I think that um, if you want to go into comics or into anything creative in general, you really have to make a decision. You have to decide whether it's more important for you to make your money off of this creative passion or like make your living, like feed yourself, or whether it's more important for you to use this creative passion to express yourself. And if it's, um, if it's the first, then you'll pursue it one way. Like in, in comics or in animation, you would go to CalArts or you would go to Expressions New Media in the Bay Area and, and get a degree in something very practical. And you also have to be very settled with using your talents to tell other people's stories because that's probably what you'll be doing for the most part. If you want to go the second route, if you want to go the self-expression route, you really should find a day job that you like that, that, you're, that you're also passionate about, and you should find a day job that'll give you, that'll, that'll, um, that'll leave you with energy after work to work on what you want to work on. So for me, because um, teaching is such a different thing from doing comics, because it pulls from a different energy bucket, uh, I feel like I'm able to balance the two. If it were programming, I feel like programming and comics are very similar in that they're introverted. I don't think I necessarily would be able to do that. But uh, other people can. You know, I, I know a lot of comic book artists who are lawyers or who are programmers by day. But you teach programming. I do teach programming, but it's different. Teaching programming and programming are two different things. Okay. Okay. We have an email question. Uh, what have you learned about the art form, graphic novels, cartooning, uh, from your experiences as a graphic novelist? Well, I learned that there is a lot more to learn. You know, in America especially, I think that comics are so unexplored. There's so much unexplored territory in terms of genre, yes. in terms of technique, yes. that I'm very excited about every project that I undertake. Uh, in addition, I also learned that even though it's a very personal process, it's very helpful to have a community of artists around you that you can, you can learn from. And I'm very lucky. In the Bay Area, there's a, there's a core group of cartoonists that um, share techniques and ideas with each other. It's fascinating. We have a phone call from Florida uh, from Scott. Go ahead. Hi. Where does one uh, purchase your materials, your, your comics? Do they go to the local bookstore? Do we purchase online? Or how do we purchase your stuff? Well, you can go online. It, it, the, all of my books are available on Amazon.com. Um, you can also go uh, directly to uh, Slave Labor Graphics for these two books, for my first two graphic novels. 
And you can probably also find American Born Chinese at your local library, so you don't have to spend any of your own money on it. Well, Up All Night will be out next next month, yep. and then American Born Chinese is is widely available in in many bookstores I know, as well as in libraries, as you indicated, Gene. We have another question from our audience. Go yeah. ahead. Did you um, read comics as a teenager, and if so, what were your favorites? I did. I started reading comics in the fifth grade, and then. In junior high, I stopped because I started getting interested in girls, and I had this <laughs> friend who was way more popular than me. Like, we were in seventh grade, and he already had a girlfriend. And he told me, comics are dorky. You will never get a girlfriend if you keep reading comics. So I stopped. And then in, in high school, I kind of got sucked back in because it's, you know, I think my parents met and fell in love with the library, so there's a deep tradition of nerdiness in my family, and I just got sucked back into comics. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in high school, there were three titles that I liked the best. Um, one was The Spirit by Will Eisner. Yes. Those were comics that were originally done in the 1940s, but they were reprinting them in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and he does all these amazing, brilliant techniques in, in his comic. A uh, second one was Don, uh, Don Rosa and Carl Barks' Uncle Scrooge. It's a kid's comic, but... They're really impressive storytellers. Don Rosa and Carl Barks are both really impressive storytellers. And the last one was The Incredible Hulk, who I liked partially because the writer was really good. Um, it's, his name is Peter David. He's still working in comics. And partially because he just has this really amazing physique that I admired as a teenager. <laughs> Not Peter David, the Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have another email question. Uh, do you think in words or pictures or both? I think I tend to think in both. When, when, I'm, when I'm working on, like they, they showed the, the video clip of the creative process. When I'm working on a story, I don't necessarily go through all of those pieces for every single scene. So if a scene is more dialogue heavy, I'll, I'll do a script. But if a scene is more action heavy, uh, sometimes I'll skip the script and go directly to the, the thumbnails. So it really depends on the scene. I'm intrigued. Writing, writing dialogue is different than, than writing narrative. How do you how do you become uh, accustomed to, to creating dialogue, and when do you know when dialogue is appropriate as opposed to a description? Uh, if the voice is in your head, okay. <laughs> I think okay. that's how you tell. So dialogue really for me is just listening to the voices in your head and putting them down on paper. Usually, I'll try to run that by a couple of friends to to, to see if they think it sounds authentic. Okay. We have another question from our audience. Um, yes. Uh, being a bit of a cartoonist myself, um, I know that there's a lot of different things that can influence your work. So uh, what are some other mediums that have affected your artwork personally? I think the, the, the other media, medium that has affected my artwork uh, the most is animation. Because I grew up wanting to be an animator. Um, and also because I really appreciate the more simplistic cartooning. I think for comics, um, it helps the reader go through your page more easily, you know, if, if you have a simple cartooning style. And I also have very pragmatic um, reasons for preferring that. Because I'm a teacher by day, I don't have as much time as I'd like to, to draw comics, so a simple style helps me go faster. Interesting. You, you, you have to do research, as, you, as was indicated in the... Um uh, clip that we saw about your creative process for visuals, um, but beyond beyond site visits, well, how do you research? I mean, you couldn't research Monkey King, for example. Well, I, I read translations of, of uh, Journey to the West, which is the the novel that uh, the Monkey King, you know, that the Monkey King starred in. So I did I did research in that way. And uh, American Moor Chinese is is um, so personal that a lot of the research was just jogging through my own memories about growing up. Interesting. I'm working on a, another project right now um, that I'm both writing and drawing that is a historical fiction piece set at the time of the Boxer Rebellion in China. And this is the first project that I've done that I've had to do a lot of research for, both visual and, you know, in terms of um, events. Tell, tell me about it. I mean, what, what kind of research and how are you going about it? Um, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. So I'm, I'm talking okay. to other cartoonists on how to do it. Uh, so far, what I've done is I've, I've checked out everything I could from my local library, both the local public library and our local university library. Uh, I've also uh, made a trip to France where I visited a Jesuit archive, and they had all these great pictures 
from around that time frame, from late 1800s, early 1900s China. So I, I took pictures of those photographs, I've scanned some of them in, and I'm going to be using that for the visuals. And I'm still looking for um, personal memoirs of missionaries that oh, were active at, at that time. And that might help you get the dialogue, get that voice in your head. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> You mentioned traveling. You, you, you travel to research, but also with the, the awards that American-born Chinese has received, have received, uh, you're, you're traveling a great deal more. Does traveling have an influence on you, and if so, how? Well, it makes me more tired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I've, I've actually I've had the, the opportunity to travel quite a bit at, since the publication of American-born Chinese, and I, I just feel really lucky to be able to see all these different parts of the country and to meet all these different creators. You know, I've met prose authors and cartoonists, and they've all been fascinating. It's wonderful to trade, trade techniques with other people. We've run out of time, Jin Yang. Many thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. It was a lot of fun. It's, it, I'd also like to thank Kelly, uh, Kelly's class. <laughs> Uh, from Hilton High School in the studio. Thanks, too, to the viewing audience from across the country for tuning into the program. Until next time, goodbye. Meet the artists after the show. You and your students can ask questions of the artists after each broadcast by emailing us at kcperfarts at aol.com. Don't forget to visit us online. There you'll find dozens of archived programs from previous seasons that feature artists such as members of the National Symphony Orchestra, Ballet Hispanico, the Billy Taylor Trio, lyricist Stephen Schwartz, cast members from Maine, and many more. Prepare for each program by downloading the study guide. Each guide includes background information about the artists, instructional activities, and additional resources to use in the classroom. The Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series, bringing the arts to your classroom. Time for Three, a trio of classically trained string players engage audiences of all ages with a mix of musical performances that include bluegrass, classical, and jazz. This garage band also demonstrates their improvisational style, which has turned jam sessions into original music compositions. Time for Three will be broadcast on Wednesday, April 16th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series, bringing the arts to your classroom. <laughs>